some conferences they hand out a bell or a buzzer to get people in. We're just going to improvise. This is the uh, economics panel. You're going to find a little more entrepreneurship in the, uh, in the panel and its conduct. Okay. Good morning, everyone. We've had a really, really packed morning, so let's just dive in to our next session. My name is Carlo Dade. I'm the director of the Trade and Investment Center at the Canada West Foundation uh, think tank created 50 years ago to uh, give voice to Western policy aspirations and concerns in the Canadian Federation. I'd like to thank the organizers, the Commandeur de la Conférence pour l'Invitation de l'Ouest de Canada, d'être là ce matin. Uh, it's always good to have Western voices, um, and it's important, I think, in conversations about Canada to understand the various perspectives. What we mean by Canada is not just the federal government. The reality of Canada is that you're dealing more to some degree with the United Arab Emirates than you are with the United States. So in discussions about foreign policy, but certainly economic policy, provincial views are important. So with that note, uh, let's set up the next panel. So we're doing things a little bit different, as you can tell with the improvised door chime, uh, than, the, than the other panels. I'm going to give, I think we decided, or I just decided, that we're You're going... You're moderator, it's your prerogative. <laughs> I like to share responsibility and blame here. Uh, we decided that uh, I'll do a quick uh, framing of the economics, and then the panelists will have unscripted, scripted remarks um, in the form of questions. Um, and we're going to have two questions with back and forth amongst the panelists, and then hopefully we'll have uh, room or time for questions from the floor. Dan Chiriak is here, so I wasn't going to have questions, but I decided to make room for questions since Dan's in the room. So in terms of you know, the, the economic aspects of the relationship, the organizers have done a fantastic job on the strategic elements. We've had maritime security. We'll have cyber security. Uh, we're going to have security security talks. But in terms of the importance of the relationship, certainly for Canada, economics and trade are front and center. Two thirds, or just under two thirds, of this country's GDP comes from moving goods, people, money, ideas in and out of Canada. That is three times more important than for the Americans, and half again as important as for the Australians. For Canada, trade is where the rubber meets the road for our engagement globally, and certainly in what's come to be called the Indo-Pacific region. So given the importance of trade for us, and given the importance of trade in defining relations in the region, every day, tens of millions of businesses, hundreds of millions of people, interacting in commerce, this is really where you want to focus time and attention in thinking about the quotidian impacts of thinking about engagement in the region. So we've got a really great panel to help us work through some of these issues. And I'll start with uh, our panelists joining us by Zoom. Uh, first, we have Mark Kruger. Mark is with Yichai He's the opinion editor at Yichai Global, which is part of the Shanghai Media Group. Mark is normally based in Shanghai, but we're fortunate, uh, fortunate for him that he doesn't have to get up early, that he's in Montreal uh, this morning. Uh, we also have Ying Li, who joins us from the West Coast. She is an associate professor at the University of Oregon, a non-resident fellow down at UC San Diego, so she's half duck, half triton. Uh, the Americans in the room will get that joke. But most notably, even more impressively, she's a fellow at the Peterson Institute of International Economics in Washington, DC. Those involved in trade and economics recognize uh, the Peterson name and just how important that is. To my immediate left, Rachel Simba. Well, you know Rachel from yesterday. Um, so we won't go through her entire bio again. 
but um, she's a non-resident with the Center for New American Security, and you heard her thoughts on energy and know how well-versed she is in the region. She also has a uh, consulting and advisory service uh, for businesses, so a, a very good perspective there. And to my far left, Sharon Sun, uh, my colleague at the Canada West Foundation. Sharon is also working on her PhD at Carleton, uh, focusing on Chinese trade agreements and Chinese performance with trade agreements. She's also, I think, the youngest fellow in the history of the Asia Pacific Foundation. I think uh, one of the two Jeffs can correct me on that, but she's certainly close. Uh, Sharon's also become a very important voice since coming out to Calgary a few years ago uh, for the defense and advancement of Western interests within the Federation. So personally, it's always heartwarming to see someone make that transition. And before we start, um, a quick note on something that's been said at the conference. There has been quite a bit of talk about critical minerals and economic engagement strategies at the federal level. Certainly with critical minerals, there is no federal critical mineral strategy. There is an aspirational federal critical mineral strategy. The reality is there are provincial critical mineral strategies. And that's a perspective when thinking about economics and trade. The provincial role in Canada is really important. Things like minerals are 100% a provincial responsibility. So when thinking about engagement, the European Union demanded that the Canadian provinces join the trade negotiations in recognition of these areas of provincial responsibility. So for the representatives of foreign missions in the room and those joining from outside of Canada, um, that's an important framework to think about, more so on the economic front than some of the other discussions we've had on security and other things. So with that, Let's jump into the first question. So, Canada is preparing to announce an Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, we're expecting it within the next couple of weeks. I think there are probably people in this room who have a better idea than a couple of weeks, probably an exact date, but it is going to come out soon. The strategy will reorganize, potentially add, new resources to Canadian engagement in the region certainly on the economic front, uh, trade commissioner services, other economic resources, forums in which to engage, personnel to engage in forums. We're going to drop this Indo-Pacific strategy into an alphabet soup, a noodle bowl of different trade agreements, different architecture. We have RCEP, TPP. We have the physical manifestations of these trade architecture, BRI, the GPII or IGPII, the, 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 the follow-on to build back better, the America, the G7 attempt to match China on the Belt and Road. So given this architecture and given that Canada's looking to drop its Indo-Pacific strategy into this framework, from an economic perspective, what is most important for Canada? Where should Canada focus its efforts and attention. What would be a mistake if Canada didn't pick it up in terms of uh, engagement in the region? And what are some ways that Canada can engage with uh, our speakers, our panelists' choice of most important topic? So I think we agreed earlier uh, on the order, and we're going to start on the far west coast uh, in Oregon. Thanks very much, Carlo, and uh, thanks to the organizers for this invitation to participate. It's a real pleasure to, to be here virtually. So I think to, to address these broad questions that Carlo has, has brought up, it's important to take a step back and think about what kinds of guiding principles should, uh, should um, undergird uh, Canadian trade policy. And here, from my perspective, I think we need to be concerned about the fragmentation of the global trading system into 
what we could think of as three different worlds of trade, that each of which is undergirded by a different set of guiding principles. So which of these guiding principles best serve Canadian national interests? So in the, in the first world, we have you know, the pre-existing world of open international rules, where, we, where countries rely on a common set of rules to cooperate. If there's conflict, there's a common set of rules to manage that conflict. And the World Trade Organization provides this main framework. The WTO, of course, faces multiple challenges. It's not to say that there has been no action, however, on the multilateral front. Um, progress has tended to be more issue-specific, such as on trade facilitation and sub uh, fishery subsidies and so on. So that system is still in place. However, it's increasingly being outpaced by developments in what we could think of as a sovereignty first world. In the sovereignty first world, we have cooperation overshadowed by a zero sum view of the world. Um, instead of cooperation, coercion is the tool of choice, right? So here we have punitive unilateral actions that um, are designed to create barriers to, to cooperation. So this, you know, there are many examples here. There's the, the tariff war between the US and China, Alongside that, in the technology sphere, the various rounds of export controls of technology and technology manufacturing equipment to China. China, of course, has placed its own export restrictions on various countries, including Canada, Australia, Lithuania, just to name a few. Uh, the United States has stepped up its investment screenings uh, of, of not just inbound um, uh, investments from Chinese companies, but also of outbound American investments into Chinese companies. All of this undergirded by the zero sum view of the world where security concerns frame economic cooperation. And then at the, third, at, at, at the same time, we have this third world emerging of competing coalitions. In the competing coalitions world, um, select group of countries do cooperate, but there, there are divisions between rival spheres. So within a coalition, there might be smoother trade flows and smoother economic cooperation. It's not clear to me that there are clear rules undergirding this cooperation. If there's conflict that emerges within a coalition, what rules would manage this conflict? I think that's still uncertain. And then there's a lot more friction to economic exchange between the competing spheres. So Carlo has listed some of these examples already, right? The, the um, uh, follow-up to the Build Back Better World initiative, the rather vague Indo-Pacific economic framework launched by the Biden administration that's built around the idea of building coalitions to counter challenges created by a rising China. Um, we could bring in the uh, non-market economy termination clause in the USMCA if we wanted to. Um, there's been less developments in the EU-US Trade and Technology Council, but one of its, its tasks also is to come up with common approaches to deal with contentious issues related to China. So we have these different guiding principles that are shaping different uh, developments in the global economic uh, uh, market right now. So in terms of considerations for China, I think U.S. China, uh, sorry for Canada. So U.S. China tensions are increasingly drawing other countries, including Canada, many other uh, third countries, and in, into these worlds of sovereignty first, into the worlds of competing coalitions. I think it's important to take a step back and think what basic guiding principles best serve Canadian national interests. Do the benefits of a competing coalition's world outweigh the necessary costs? And there are very necessary costs that need to uh, that will be incurred if those are the guiding principles that uh, shape foreign policy in Canada. Is it possible to actually draw, <coughs> excuse me, clear lines of membership for who belongs into in one coalition versus another? Is it actually possible to align business interests with foreign policy imperatives? Um, I think all of these discussions and, and debates can occur at the provincial level. That there, there might be. Um, uh, different provincial interests in, in, and answers to all of these questions. But I think a step back to thinking about guiding principles should be the first, uh, first step forward. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. That's a great response, and that's great advice to us, coordination and coordination on thinking about how the various interests in Canada react to that world of competing blocks. All right. Uh, Mr. Kruger, I believe uh, you volunteered to go next. Thank you very much, Carlo. <clears throat> so it's, a, it's an ugly world out there for those, of the, uh, for those of us who follow trade policy. It's, it's as ugly as I can remember in my, in my 30 years uh, of looking at trade policy. The, the one uh, bright spot, though, I think, is um, this Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP. Uh, which came into effect on uh, January 1st. And I want to explore here for a couple of minutes um, the extent to which we can milk the RCEP and, and get back some kind of good feeling towards uh, trade policy. So the RCEP is a multilateral trade agreement among 10 ASEAN countries, China, Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. It's the world's largest regional trade agreement. It covers larger trades of global GDP, larger shares of global GDP, uh, global goods trade, and, uh, and global population, then uh, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, then the EU-Japan trade agreement, and then the uh, Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPP, CPTPP. So it's a big, it's, it's big. Um, it's been 10 years in the making. And it hasn't always been smooth sailing. Japan was an original party to the negotiations, but it dropped out in 2019. Now, the ASEAN countries already had individual plus one trade agreements, which with each of the other RCEP members, as well as with India. However, over time, these individual agreements gave to a so-called noodle bowl of rules and regulations. And the RCEP was seen as a way of harmonizing and streamlining uh, trade policy in the region so as to reduce the cost of business. Now, the RCEP also provided for enhanced commitments on certain services, e-commerce, competition policy, and intellectual property rights. Although the motivation for the RCEP came from ASEAN, one of its key achievements was linking China, Japan, and Korea under a single regional agreement. Now, China, Japan, and Korea had initiated trade talks about a decade ago, and despite 19 rounds of discussions, an agreement remains unconcluded among the three, the three countries. So the launch of the RCEP is seen really as a testament to ASEAN's middle power diplomacy. Now, it's called a free trade agreement, but it's not entirely free trade, uh, but it's a big step up. So currently, only 8% of China's imports from Japan by tariff line enter China tariff free, 8%. Under RCEP, China will eventually eliminate 86% of the uh, uh, of the tariffs of the tariffs on the types of goods it imports uh, from Japan. While parties to the RCEP have agreed to eliminate tariffs on 92% of the lines over 20 years, they will continue to protect sensitive se sectors like agriculture where 17% of the tariff lines are unmodified by RCEP, and the average tariff on these lines is 70%. Now, analysts point to harmonized rules of origin as one of the RCEP's key achievements. These are the rules that determine the minimum value threshold for a good to be considered Thai or Malaysian and benefit from the lower uh, tariff under the trade agreement. Before the RCEP, um, there were... Um, five different sets of rules of origin, one for each of the plus one agreements that ASEAN had with the other members. And this tended to frag fragment uh, production in the Asia Pacific market. If disputes arise among between its members, the RCEP provides a mechanism for dispute settlement under which a panel of experts can be convened to adjudicate the issue. Economists have modeled the benefits of RCEP. They find that by 2030, trade liberalization will raise the GDP of the 15 members by an aggregate $174 billion, or about 4% of aggregate GDP. Of this, the biggest chunk, $85 billion, will accrue to China. That's about 0.3% of its GDP. But the biggest winners from the RCEP as a percent of GDP are expected to be Japan and Korea, both of whom will see gains in the 1% range. 
Now, I think it's really important that other countries, even those outside of Asia, will be welcome to join the RCEP in the summer of 2023. So in a world in which countries are being asked to pick sides, I believe that Canada should keep all its op options open and enthusiastically sign up to join the RCEP when membership opens up again. Thanks very much. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, you know, with that view on RCEP, I think you'd make a good Western Canadian. There is quite a bit of difference in Canada as to whether or not the country, uh, the various constituent members of the country should be part of that trade block. All right. We're going to, Rachel, you're going last. Yeah. So yeah, so that takes us to, uh, to Sharon. Sounds good, thanks so much. Um, that was great. So um, Mark just talked about RCEP. I'm going to talk about the other agreement that is the most important for Canada in the region, which is the CPTPP. I'm just gonna call it TPP for short, um, but the TPP is not only significant for Canada in the sense that it is our only and largest uh, trade bloc that we belong to in the region, but it's also making a lot of progress. Um, so just a little background. Um, so originally TPP, as we all know, was uh, initially developed to protect us from China. Um, it was under the Biden administration uh, to uh, not sure if it's, I guess the debate is whether or not it, it was to contain China or not, but at least it protects us from China. Um, when the Trump administration came in and decided to pull out of the TBP, um, Canada West did a lot of work to push for Canada to continue to stay in the TPP because it also protects us from the US in this market in terms of uh, competition and trade. So since then, uh, out of the 11 members, seven have ratified and implemented, including Canada. But the progress is actually in recent years where Peru, Chile, Malaysia, Brunei, these were the four countries that still hadn't ratified the TPP. Uh, last year, the P Peruvian Congress um, finally approved the TPP just before the new administration under the Castillo. Uh, which many believed would have seriously compromised the agreement. And so the, ra uh, the ratification took place last September, so making Peru the eighth member to ratify. Uh, Malaysia also finally ratified the TPP last month, um, and they're expecting a trade increase of $655 billion, uh, with the bloc uh, in 2030. Um, and also Chile is underway. So after four years of legislative debate, its Congress finally voted to approve the TPP just a few weeks ago. So there's a lot of progress in terms of moving forward in ratification by existing members, but also we have seen new entrant interests. UK has officially applied and is under negotiations. And we've seen uh, interest in terms of official application by China, uh, by Taiwan, um, and very close uh, to very closely after China officially applied, um, South Korea immediately showed interest and has done its own feasibility study in joining the TPP. So there's a lot of opportunity there uh, in terms of new entrants. Just in terms of performance wise, last year Canada's export growth to the TPP block was 19%. So this is compared to 11% to China as of last year. Um, during the pandemic, when we looked at 2019, when you know COVID was just uh, introduced in by China and also in the region, Canada's export to China declined by 16% compared to with the TPP bloc, which was 3%. And then in 2020, when it got caught up with the rest of the world, we saw a Canadian export decline with US of minus 14%. And during that time with the TPP block, it was 7%. So the TPP block has actually been, been doing quite well and has rebounded quite quickly. So again, opportunities for Canada. But my point is, for a trade agreement that is considered a gold standard by, by many, uh, it's one of the most comprehensive agreements uh, in providing rules-based trading environment um, that have 
real enhanced market access capability through actual tariff reduction compared to IPEF, for example, Canada is actually taking a very passive approach in the sense that we're, we just wait for other countries to show interest, to apply, and then we, we negotiate. We are not actually actively um, promoting new entrants, uh, encouraging and showing why it is in their best interest in the region to join. That's, that's in our interest to do that. It's in Canada's interest to do that, especially when we look at the U.S. right now. Under IPEF, uh, if you look at uh, from inside trade, a lot of business groups, even lawmakers, are pushing for real, uh, for traditional market access components to be integrated with the IPEF, so real tariff reductions. Um, and that's something that we already have in the TPP. So why should we not be promoting that and pushing that or encouraging U.S. to rejoin? Um, I think. Uh, we should play a more active role uh, in this front. Thanks. And, you know, that is a great point. If you look at any analysis or by the business community or commentary by the U.S. business community on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, the first, second, and third comment will be market access, tariff reductions. Nice but, nice but. And it, yeah, it is amazing that we often forget that we have what the Americans and a lot of others already want. Um, speaking of IPEF, I think uh, that's where you're going, Rachel, no? It's definitely going to be where I, where I start, um, <laughs> though I'm also going to talk about, you know, we're talking here about trade, but I think we also have to bring in all of the sort of muscular tools that are being used to reshape trade, um, because you know, which is obviously part of the, the pathway we're, we're looking at. So, I mean, I, I guess the big sort of takeaway that I think all of the panelists have, have sort of talked about is that we are dealing with a world where, if anything, the sort of U.S. right now having, you know, tried to lay the playing field or, or sort of reshape the playing field with tariffs some years ago and kept those in place is now very much focused on a standards, not market access, you know, approach. And, and I was recently at an event where Catherine Tai spoke, and I think I uh, anonymously posed a question of, you know, what do you say when people ask for market access, whether it's within the U.S. or um, globally? And she said, well, standards are about market access. I mean, it, clearly I had a nerve. And, and to some extent that's true, right, in a world where sort of sizable non-tariff barriers and particularly between developed economies and, and there is some argument about raising the sort of, you know, sort of raising the standards and particularly around environmental and other rules. But, I mean, it was really dodging the question. Um, but I do think we have a sort of a U.S. administration right now that uh, was, A, not willing to go to Congress and ask for um, Trade Promotion Authority, so which basically was shutting the door on, on sort of sign uh, bringing anything to Congress that would require Congress to sign off on it, which is basically anything designed as a trade agreement, and is using bilateral and multilateral vehicles to try to push elements. And then we see right now, and it's not Asia per se, but even today, um, lots of press reports around negotiations within the TTC structure, the EU US. Um, uh, venue uh, about the same, somewhat same issues that Canada had with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act around um, U.S. attempts to keep the benefits of its subsidies on electric vehicles at home to stop that <clears throat> leakage. Um, now, of course, you can make a stronger argument in Canada with the integration of the North American automotive industry, um, you know, I, I might say this, um, but what is sort of clear is that one of the other parts of what, what the U.S. is promulgating is a view to allow their allies to have more space to do policies that support their own economies. Um, part of this is, is about making democracies work for their population, but it's not so, um, it doesn't necessarily reverberate that well for um, all of the, the trading partners. And I think we'll get to that when we talk friend shoring and, and decoupling and the like. Um, so overall, what I think we see in the, you know, in IPIF is um, in a sense, a, a number of standards some goals, some perhaps laudable understanding of supply chain vulnerability, though some of that, I think 
a lot of countries have spent time doing that mapping in the last few years, um, which was necessary because of, co because of COVID um, and because of those restrictions. But there's not a lot there there, um, especially on the trade and the, and the liberalization side. Um, what I do see a lot more of both within IPIF and within some of these bilateral and multilateral groups is um, the U.S. Uh, wanting to use other um, economic tools, right? Um, Yiling talked at the beginning about coercive tools, um, which you know, which we have, which have been increasingly used towards um, sort of China, um, but also um, to China and others to stop exports to Russia. Um, we've seen the U.S. sort of national security advisor Jake Sullivan really comment on using export controls as a strategic tool. I mean, this is a real sort of game changer. And one of the areas where I would say, if anything, if there's been a... Um, I hope that there's been some understanding that financial sanctions have their limitations and have blowback, despite being someone that spends most of their time on these tools. But with export controls, if anything, I think there's been the, this message that they, that, 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 that they work, maybe they're not costless, and I think there's probably, I think the events of the last few weeks have showed us that even when the U.S. Department of Commerce thinks that they're targeting something, A, they're not necessarily targeting it, and the goals, which in this case are about limiting China from, ac from access to the top of the line processing chips, but also the ability to produce them and develop their own industry, um, uh, can have can set off a chain of motion that is well beyond that. And, and we can get into that um, obviously later in our discussion. Um, but I guess the thing I'd sort of leave you, or sort of you know maybe conclude with, is to say that we are seeing an environment both where there is more use of coercive restrictive tools, but also more positive or affirmative tools of industrial policy, particularly in the U.S., but also in other countries, and that we are seeing a bit of an all, not just all of the above, but a using all the tools when there is something of either political, you know, sort of very important political goal, but also economic policy goal. And sometimes those links, those, those tools are, are a bit more linked. And that, that effort of using all the tools, whether that's financial sanctions or investment restrictions or export controls um, or outbound investment screening is not only being used on small countries like um, Iran or Ethiopia or elsewhere, it is increasing right now, obviously, for to good being used on Russia, but also increasingly on a sectoral level being used to think about um, China, you know, sort of China. And I think that puts Canada in a tough, a tough position, particularly because I think, and, and other allies as well, right? And so I think one of the recommendations is continuing to stay up not only with sort of the Americans on these tools, but also to, to find allies both in Europe and Asia for, you know, when there is common cause. Um, but to sort of highlight and, and understand uh, and think about what the framework should look like. I mean, we're right now in the context on the export control side with not only sort of using these tools well, bef well in, in excess of where what we used to think of as dual use uh, te technologies, um, a lot more things are on that list, but we're also in an environment where the international organization designed to manage it, the Vassenaar Agreement, is effectively um, non-functional non in part because members include Russia and, and Belarus. And so I'm not saying we throw out that organization, but there are sort of questions there. Um, particularly, I think, in, in the sort of context, you know, go, uh, going forward. But so overall, I also think there's things Canada can do um, uh, internationally, but there also, of course, are things that can be done at home um, to sort of take more advantage of some of the things the fellow panelists have talked about. Those probably include um, leaning into some of the resources, not only trade commissioners, but also the kind of work that EDC and the like do, um, and do more of it and think about, about these risks. I'm going to stop here because I'm sure I went way over time and look forward to the discussion. Well, I had you down for another 30 seconds, so. <laughs> Ah, always better to leave you wanting more. <laughs> no, that, 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 that's a really interesting conceptualization if you think about it. One, the other response by the U.S. administration to complaints about market access is that they're tackling non-tariff barriers, which are a, arguably a, in, in the modern world where tariffs have gone down, MFN, 
uh, non-tariff barriers have emerged. So the Americans are taking steps to reduce NTBs, which they did with their phase one agreement to China, where they bleeped Canada over once again, shivved us in the back, but we're not bitter about that at all out west. Um, but um, on the other hand, they're raising new barriers to trade with the security issues. So yeah. do you think it's a net win or a net loss? I think, I think it's, uh, I think for, it's for more free, of a net loss. For free yeah. trade, for the yeah. free movement of goods, obviously, for the not free security movement, stuff. Oh, for, for the free movement of goods, I think it's a net loss. Um, just because I do think that there is more, um, you know, sort of there are more sort of, you know, barriers and, and, and monitoring. Um, some of that is good, right? Some of that is necessary. But I think the blurring of the lines and broadening of the security risks, I think, raises, you know, is responding um, is, there, is there a weird beep? Um, uh, I think from a free trade perspective, but I think we also have to be honest that we live in a world where many countries were looking to not only deepen their own sort of supply chains and we're looking to remake the rules. Um, no, U.S. is maybe most uh, predominant in that, but um, you know, I'd be interested to hear what the other panelists have to say. I know Sharon well, wants to come yeah, in. Yeah, <laughs> I just, I think what you mentioned in terms of like using all the tools, I think that's a really good wake up for, call for Canada in the sense that, you know, we're talking about decoupling, we're talking about friend shoring, but who, who is going to be our friend? And if we look at the U.S. and we see increasing, you know, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, for example, so where is the, where is the line and um, how much are we going to be expected to align with the U.S. ambition on, in terms of export control in terms of what can be traded, what cannot be traded. Um, so I think it actually presents a lot of vulnerability for Canada um, in thinking this way for this region where China is obviously the largest importer and exporter and player in every aspect with every single country in that region. So even if you want to decouple or run away from China, you're still somehow engaging in China if you want to diversify your trade to Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam. Well, who is their largest trading partner? Let's look at the infrastructure connectivity, Belt and Road Initiative, right? So we have to consider China uh, in this perspective in terms of engaging and tracking and this idea of just decoupling or friendshoring, whatever that means, um, is, is put into question. Thanks. That's a, you know, that's a great point. It's not only the, the reality of decoupling. We've heard talk, uh, Frankie, sorry, um, Minister Champagne was just in Washington, D.C., making comments to the effect that Canada needs to decouple. But no, this is something that we say at Canada West all the time. As a heavily trade-dependent country, 60, over 60% 60 of your GDP coming from moving goods in and out, agreements around the world, yes, 70% of our total trade goes to the U.S., but in agriculture, that number drops to 50%. And you look at certain sectors, the numbers U.S. versus world get inverted. So for a country as exposed as Canada, if you try to run away from China, you're going to run into China, in Indonesia, in India, even in Brazil. And you're probably going to be running on a road that the Chinese built. And if there's a train coming down the track about to hit you, it's on a Chinese track, and it's probably a Chinese train. So the thought that you can simply not engage the yeah. mainland and leave China behind is something that's a challenge for Canadian policymakers, because we don't have the understanding to know that if you run away from China, you still run into China. If you lack that basic understanding, if you lack the understanding of China's five-year plan, you only know that it's a plan, it's five years, and it's got something to do with China, well, then you're in for a world of hurt where China is the world's largest economy, second largest economy at that uh, real GDP. So thinking about the, the earlier question, we have all these attempts to put physical architecture in place, and we've had, as you've alluded to, Rachel, the emergence of an intellectual framework to try and grapple with how policymakers and businesses should think about navigating these different blocks. Ye Ling's point about 
where does Canada fit in the world of competing blocks? So you've had ideas, decoupling we've talked about, but you've also had the Americans with this friend-shoring idea, um, a concept that's still struggling to have form, to have substance. Um, it's more concept than theory, uh, as opposed to Indo-Pacific, which went from concept to cliche in record time. The, the, the friend-shoring idea is still, still emerging. So how should we think about the, the friend-shoring idea and decoupling? Is friend-shoring just a terrible term, a ridiculous term, and a ridiculous idea, or is there something to the idea that's actually of substance? And what should Canada be thinking about the U.S. pushing this? Sure. Um, I'll kick it off, but I'm sure that uh, all the rest, <laughs> all, everyone else will have things to, to weigh in on this. So, I mean, I guess, in, in a sense, I think the genesis and this, like, a number of, of, of tools was, or, 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 or concepts, I think, kind of came out of uh, Treasury Department and, and Janet Yellen, among others, and, you know, sometimes in the U.S., uh, uh, you know, very much you know, framed as nearshoring instead of, um, instead of friend shoring, um, I think the friend shoring language came came later, and in some cases it was a response to what had been otherwise a reshoring and onshoring debate. Which I must say, spending a lot of time in, in Washington, um, but but thankfully not not living there, um, uh, just because it's important to have other perspectives, as as you were s saying in, in the Canadian context. Um, there's a lot more talk about reshoring and moving so things out, and a lot less talk about about French shoring. There's a lot more talk about French shoring among some of the countries that would want to be U.S. friends. Um, so I guess the way I think about it is that it's probably a, a concept and that might be operationalized in a few select sectors um, rather than sort of you know across the board. And some of it ties into what I was saying earlier about trying to come up with a set of policies that allow allies and, and like-minded countries, um, similarly structured countries perhaps, to have a little more policy space, which we might turn around and say, well, some of that sounds like protectionism, but not all, I mean, sometimes protectionism is there for a, a good reason. Um, but I think where it strikes me there's been more thought around is in thinking about critical mineral supply chains, um, and, and sort of critical industries more generally. Um, we've also seen, I think, sort of attempts to maybe have common efforts of investing more, you know, sort of investing more in sort of semiconductor and other supply chains at home in different countries. But, but in D.C., I do think there's a bit more of this sort of, you know, reshoring and onshoring. I mean, on the decoupling piece, what's interesting is I think the evidence is mixed, and some of it, again, depends sector by sector. I mean, overall, the Chinese share of, of U.S. imports is, is, is down, but imports from Asia overall are not. <laughs> um, and so this is to Sharon's point of, you know, you run away from, you know, China materializes in, in different parts of the supply chain. But there have been some real economic reasons that have driven some redundancy of supply chains, some migration of supply chains out of China. Some of it was the structural issues we talked about some years ago of increase in labor costs and and, and the like. Some of it was co recurrent COVID lockdowns and the impact on ports and shipping and just getting the goods to market. Um, some of it are even dynamics and incentive, incentives, uh, such as Sharon was talking about, and things like CPTPP, but also the big disincentive of the tariffs, the U.S. tariffs. I mean, it's no surprise that the goods that are subject from, uh, to U.S. tariffs, uh, their, their, their import into the U.S. has gone down. Looks like there's something weird going on in the Zoom screen. Um, I'm sure someone is dealing with that. Um, <laughs> but so, so that, that relocate, that those sort of multi-reasons. And so I think as policymakers, whether in Canada or elsewhere, we have to be honest about maybe some of the different drivers that are prompting businesses to, to move and not, um, you know, not draw the wrong conclusions, uh, not draw the wrong conclusions here. So, uh, you know, I do think we're sort of heading into this point, and, and, and from a U.S. context, I think we're also headed into a point where it's going to be a lot harder for the next two years and maybe beyond that to um, approve anything that involves spending, spending more money. Um, 
uh, and we were chatting about this, you know, before before the panel, um, that even sort of this sort of bipartisan, tough on China approach probably doesn't necessarily extend to spending more money. And I'm not saying that's those are all policies that I would support, but I'm just saying realistically, I think that it's going to be harder to kind of anything that has to pass Congress that either sort of spends more money to work with allies might be a tougher sell than it was in the last few years. So that includes more public investment in sort of friend shoring initiatives, which suggests to me that we're probably going to see a lot more attempts to lean on a private sector to partner and invest and, and leaning on allies to step up and spend more on subsidies. I know there's been that debate um, between the U.S. and Canada, but it's very palpable um, in the U.S. and Europe right now, and I would imagine with the developed Asian, Asian allies uh, as well. Um, and of course there, I think there's also, of course, the push in some of these bilateral relationships to think about what kind of chips alliance or other things like that. So I, I will stop there. I look forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. Yeah, the constraints that the Americans have, they lost a lot of elements for French shoring when they cut the America Competes Act down to chips. A lot of the policy framework for going to allies, negotiating with allies, a framework for dealing with allies um, in the economic context what, what was lost. Um, but they still have a ton of money they're throwing around on chips. And if I, I think one of our goals is to get them to try and throw some money <laughs> the, the, this side of the border. Um, so Mark, um, now that we've talked about trying to shake the Americans down, your take on the, uh, the, the emergence of an intellectual framework for dealing with this noodle ball and these competing blocks. Yeah, thanks, Carlo. I, I guess uh, I just have uh, one remaining thought from your previous question, and uh, I'd like to, to return to uh, Sharon's analysis of the, the TPP, and I thank her for shorting the acronym to just three letters. So, you know, we really have, uh, Canada really has an unprecedented uh, opportunity here. You know, China, as, as Sharon pointed out, uh, applied for membership in the TTP uh, in September 2021, so last September. So, you know, it wants to join, and uh, I think Canada should welcome discussions with China on how it should accede to the TPP. And, and you know, this, this does, this, China wanting something from the international community actually confers on, China, on Canada and other TPP members uh, a certain amount of leverage in terms of, you know, being able to work with China to reform its trade practices. So uh, I think this is just really an incredible opportunity. And if we're just adding to uh, Canada's to-do list, in ad uh, addition to acceding to the R RCEP, you know, Canada should really um, take upon itself this opportunity of China's wanting to join the TPP and uh, work to clarify um, issues that it finds difficult. So let's move a little bit to this uh, discussion about uh, friend shoring and, and decoupling. Again, this is a very, very difficult uh, set of issues for someone who is a free trader like I am. Uh, but let me just say that in the aftermath of the pandemic, there were lots of calls to rethink reliance on Chinese supply chains. So for example, in the spring of 2020, just after the first outbreak, the Japanese government offered 24 billion yen in loans to help companies that want, wanted to move their operations to third countries. Now the Japanese government was worried about the impact that supply chain disruptions in China might have on Japanese manufacturers. <clears throat> it wanted Japanese firms to broaden their sources of inputs buying more for Southeast Asia and to return the production of high value added products to Japan. <laughs> now, this Japanese program was curious because Japan is not especially highly dependent on China as an investment location. At the end of 2019, Japan's investments in China uh, totaled about 123 billion or 7%, only 7% of its uh, you know, international capital stock. Um, in fact, you know, that's, that's, a lot, uh, that's a lot smaller than uh, China's share of global GDP, about 17%. And, you know, China represents about a fifth of China's, sorry, China represents about a fifth of Japan's trade. So having this small uh, uh, capital stock is, is really that kind of, you know, doesn't seem to be overly exposed. 
But even if the program was fully utilized, it could have only facilitated a, the return of a very small portion of Japan's capital based uh, of Japan's China based capital stock back to Japan or to other countries. In fact, notwithstanding concerns about COVID and rising trade tensions, Japanese firms continue to increase their investments in China. By the end of last year, Japan's stock of investments in China were up at a, an additional 17 billion, about 13%. Uh, from 2019. It's worth noting that one of the first Japanese firms to take advantage of the government's relocation support program was a firm called Iris Oyama, and it began making face masks in Kakuta, Miji Prefecture. And this is ironically an, uh, an area that was very hard hit by the tsunami and earthquake in uh, 2011. Now, more broadly, um, foreign direct investment inflows into China have been very strong recently, and they provide no evidence of, of multilaterals uprooting their supply chains. So between 2015 and 2020, FDI, that, that five-year period, FDI inflows into China grew by you know, 3% annually on average. Growth accelerated to 20% in 2021, and they're in so far this year, in the year through September, they're up again uh, uh, twenty percent year over year. So you know, again, no, no, no ripping up of the supply chains. In fact, China's supply chains have proven to be among the world's most resilient. For example, when COVID led to the closure of Shanghai's port in April, increased shipping through ports in Qingdao and Ningbo made sure that the disruption was short-lived. China's supply chain resilience, in part, explains why it was able to, China was able to increase its share of goods exports to 15% last year, up from 13% in 2019. So this is a type of technical, <coughs> technical uh, you know, uh, uh, reinforcements of, of supply chains. But really, this is not, I think, the type of decoupling that we're talking about. The type of decoupling we're talking about is here driven by strategic considerations and not economic ones. Clearly, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, strategic considerations have come to the fore. Minister Freeland put these considerations front and center in her recent Brookings speech when she said, Europe is bracing for a cold and bitter lesson in the strategic folly of economic reliance on countries whose political and moral values are inimical to our own, end quote. Now, it's not clear to me, however, that similar political and moral values are a recipe for peace. Consider the centuries uh, during which Europe was racked by war, even though the combatants espoused broadly similar political and moral values. From a different perspective, we were able to collaborate with the Soviet Union, whose political and moral values seem different from ours. We, were, we collaborated with the Soviet Union to defeat Nazi Germany. So while uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has understandably led to a taking of sides, we are not at war with China. I think that a trade policy that presupposes the inevitability of war will have the perverse effect of making war more likely. I may be naive, but I refuse to believe that the war, that the war between the United States and China is inevitable. Again, to add to Canada's to-do list, perhaps Canada's first responsibility, first foreign policy responsibility, is to see that war does not break out between China and the U.S. I believe that we can profitably and sustainably trade with everyone as long as we have the backing of the right institutions. That is why the state of the WTO is so disturbing and why I am so hopeful about RCEP. Thank you. Wow. That yeah, was that was. that was a good response. All right, Sharon, your turn. <laughs> Thanks, he, he set the bar for you. Go ahead. Yep. yep. Uh, well, I don't know if I can meet that bar, but I think just wanted to add from another perspective, um, just in terms of this idea of friendshoring or decoupling, when we look at our so-called friends or allies, um, you know, U.S., Japan, Australia, Germany, they are very aggressively competing in both the Chinese market and the Southeast Asian market that we're looking at. Um, I think Mark gave some really good numbers on the RCEP. So under RCEP, 
Um, sure, one of the main concerns in Canada for RCEPT is it's not as comprehensive as TPP. Um, there's uh, not as much um, in, in terms of values uh, as we were hoping to find, but the RCEPT, if we look at the trade agreements that ASEAN have or the trade agreements that China have, it's one of the most comprehensive agreements for them. It's one of the it's one of the best agreements that they've have so far. And from that perspective, if, you know, commitment to 92% of tariff reduction from the Chinese perspective uh, over, let's say, 30 years, um, sh I mean, under NAFTA, we have, we because of NAFTA, we trade significantly with the U.S., but even then, we still have hiccups. Um, cool. We have lumber, steel, and aluminum issues. So there are always going to be these issues that may arise, whether it's non-tariff barrier or tariff barrier issues. But if you have an agreement in place um, of Chinese commitment of up to 92% tariff reduction, that seems pretty good to me. And so from that perspective, why shouldn't we, as a member of the TPP, um, be open to hearing what China can meet in terms of the commitments under the TPP. China has officially applied, so why should we not entertain the idea and just hear what do they have to offer or how are they going to meet some of the provisions that is important for us? Um, so I think there's that aspect that we should consider. And another aspect on the friendshoring is, again, I really wanted to kind of break apart what does friendshoring really mean? Does it mean that we are going to shift trade away from this country? Does it mean we are shifting our production and supply chain? Um, does it mean uh, moving existing factories and businesses away uh, in terms of production or end market? Or does it mean future? Um, so I think depending on what the definition is and depending on which sector we're talking about, I'm coming from a business and economic perspective, I think it means something really different and it can have very different impact. Um, looking at autos, for example, okay, sure, 92% of our vehicles go to US, most of the production is in North America, maybe that's pretty easy. Um, but, for example, GM just recently invested $300 million in a Chinese startup to produce and assemble battery packs for growing new energy vehicles, not only for the domestic market, but for the region. Sure, this is a U.S. firm, but then you start to think, well, how much is the U.S. willing to pay these firms to come back to the U.S. to produce there? And from the Canadian perspective, how much money do we have to do that? Um, so, and also when we think about agriculture, uh, vegetable products like pulses, 60% of our peas goes to China. And this number has been steady over the last five years, especially after Canada's diversification away from Indian non-tariff barriers. Um, so it's, it's a lot more difficult to tell them to decouple depending on what decoupling and French rain means. Um, especially when you're talking about food security. And so from that perspective, the point there is just a kind reminder that business trade and not government, and in fact businesses are actually moving around and adjusting strategically and responding in a much more timely fashion than government would. Um, and I think canola is a really good example. Um, we all know canola um, had a lot of issues with China and there was significant decline in 2019 in Canadian canola seed export to China. We basically tried to displace $2 billion of canola that year that China tried to cut off from us. And so we managed to increase significantly to 10 different countries to diversify our canola export. But we were still about $540 million short. Um, but today, if we look at the canola industry, um, firstly, they immediately went back um, the moment China reinstated the, the uh, Richardson and Viterra licenses. But secondly, it wasn't the government that solved the canola issue. It was market development. It was canola that solved itself. Um, um, the West increased canola crushing in Canada 
in part to respond to the China risk, but it really was the renewable fuel standard that was really driving um, not only to increase crushing, but increasing biofuel production with Canadian canola. Um, and so we see product diversification um, there. So we didn't solve the canola problem, the canola solved itself. Um, so from this perspective, in terms of what can Canada actually do, well, businesses are already doing this. They are on the ground, they respond faster than government, but so in the gov uh, so institutions like EDC plays a really important role there. Um, but um, just to close, the on the government front, I would argue that providing reliable infrastructure, uh, transportation systems so that these businesses can actually get to the market. So my main point is what can Canada do? We can increase our own capability, our own capacity. Yesterday we talked so much about opportunities in LNG and green energy and hydrogen in the Southeast Asia market, but what's the point of talking about this if we can't actually move the goods there? And so that's what governments can really do uh, is to um, kind of integrate and enhance our trade infrastructure to actually allow us to move, um, to walk the talk, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's my point. That was very good. You hit the bar. Uh, before going back to Yiling, I think the canola point's critical. Um, so let me go back and touch on this. In these sorts of forum, again, the, the relationship are tens of millions of business transactions, business decisions every day. This is where decoupling gets decided or, 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 or not. It's where engagement, it, it's where new supply chains get decided not in policy rooms, not in places like Ottawa, and not in Fort Pearson. The reality is business is in charge of making decisions in open countries where markets and government doesn't take um, a, a leading role in the economy. With canola, two years from now, I do not see us exporting any canola to China. The four crush plants that Sharon mentioned in Saskatchewan, uh, the expansion at Yorkton, the three new plants, the potential for a fifth plant down at Northgate, hard on the U.S. border, have the potential to take a total of total canola seed amount that's greater than what we export to China every year. China, Japan, back and forth for number one, number two in canola seed exports, Mexico number three. We just we can't increase canola production. I mean, if anyone who knows anything about agriculture understands crop rotation, we don't have the ability to simply ramp up to meet the demand. And this is hard demand from refineries that sign long-term contracts at very good prices. So the market has, in essence, taken care of the canola issue with China. This was not government policy any government policy on renewable fuel standards and renewable diesel uh, has had the inadvertent, unintended, I would argue, non thought of consequence of potentially taking care of the canola issue. We've seen the same thing with peas. The development of the pea processing industry for plant protein in Canada, the government investment in the plant protein supercluster has had the inadvertent, unintended consequence of cutting our dependence on China. So when we think of reshoring, nearshoring, events, events, dear boy, events can overtake policy. Private sector actions can overtake government policy uh, in, in some instances. So that's really important, especially in the forum here in Ottawa, to bring in that reality. Yeling, that sets you up for what will be our last comment, because I think we should leave some time for uh, questions on the floor. Thanks very much. So to build on all my fellow panelists' uh, comments, you know, to me, I don't understand the goal of friendshoring. Recent events have put forward a number of pressing concerns for a lot of governments and businesses. Most of these surround supply chain resilience and supply chain security. The two are different concepts because they imply different uh, policy responses, they imply different 
business responses. And it's not clear to me that French shoring hits either of those targets. So if we're concerned about supply chain resilience, stronger resilience implies greater ease of substitutability. Uh, so you want to source both domestically, you want to source internationally, because you never know where the disruption is, where the next disruption is going to be coming from. If a firm or a country thinks that they're overly reliant on a single source, right? It might be China, but depending on the good, it might be other countries. Supply chain resilience implies diversification, but not a total exit. And the shifting is going to be driven by the underlying manufacturing and resource capabilities of other countries rather than foreign policy concerns. So that, to me, that kind of supply chain logic, that diversification logic drives stronger resilience. If we're concerned about supply chain security, that falls under a very narrow set of goods. That might mean decoupling. And we see, I think, in the export controls being imposed by the United States, those, con those concerns of supply chain security. That has actually reduced the, uh, the resilience of supply chain. So China right now in, in, in responding to the export controls is trying to reshore or build within its own um, territorial boundaries um, a holistic supply chain uh, production capacity, design capacity for semiconductors. That implies lower resilience to me, right? Because it, it, it's, it's not looking outwards, it's just looking inwards. And it also, whether or not it succeeds is, is, a, is a huge question. So where does friend shoring lie and what is it trying to solve problems of resilience or is it trying to solve problems of security? It's, it's highly ambiguous to me. Um, how resilient can your supply chains be if you're restricting trade to within a very ambiguous definition of friends, right? And, and, and if friendship um, and trustworthiness on, on um, regime type considerations uh, is driving your location decisions rather than underlying capabilities, right? I think there's gonna be a cost there in terms of resilience. If the goal is security, then it seems to me that the policy solution ought to be a lot more targeted and it ought to be in the name of enhancing national security rather than trying to divide your trade relationships into those that are friends versus those that are not friends. So I think if, that, if we want to increase resilience, we have a set of policy solutions that should drive resilience, that, that's about diversification. It should be driven by businesses first and foremost because they're, most, they're more nimble and they have much better information about where the alternative sources are. If it's security, I think the policy solution ought to be packaged much more narrowly because right now the friend shoring term has the um, negative potential of creating negative spillovers to parts of trading relationships that don't need to be securitized. Thanks. Okay, well, uh, if anyone has questions, we have a few minutes. Just a, a, a comment on the, the, the friend shoring issue too. It is a political decision. It's a political concept. Um, as such, it may start with security. It may start with a hard analysis, a technical analysis of security concerns. But as a political process, it will become increasingly political, especially in the context of the United States and elsewhere. Once that corruption sets in, um, the concept goes all sorts of places that uh, aren't intended. And um, what starts as a somewhat reasonable sounding idea can very, very, very quickly um, turn into something else. Zach. Hi, thanks very much, Zach Pakin, Research Fellow, Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. I've got a couple of questions, uh, one for, for Mark perhaps or anyone else who wants to jump in on it. But uh, obviously the TPP and RCEP are two very different kinds of agreements. But I'm wondering if there are still any active discussions going on in certain capitals of those countries that are members of both agreements, certain ASEAN states, uh, you know, Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, about whether it's possible to harmonize those two agreements at some point, and if so, what the time scale for that might be. 
or is that just fundamentally dependent on the course of, of the US-China rivalry and when, what course that takes? Um, and, and my second question, I suppose, is for Carlo, because you raised the, the issue of how the numbers for Canada look a little bit different when you look at specific sectors in terms of our dependence on the United States. Now, I remember that before the, the Great Recession, more than a decade ago, about 85% of Canadian exports went to the US. As a result of, of the recession, that number more or less on its own went down to around 70 to 75%, thanks to no you know, particular push of our own. But it stayed put around there more or less ever since, despite some of the push that we've done. Now, I'm, I'm old enough to remember at this point when everyone was talking about CETA between Canada and the EU and how this was going to place us uniquely between Europe and the United States as a gateway to both. Uh, and you know this would have been strengthened by the fact that we would have signed the agreement before the TTIP talks concluded, which of course they never did when Trump came to office. But if we look at the numbers, it looks like Canada-EU trade hasn't really fundamentally benefited as a result of that agreement being in place. So you know, even if Canada is successful in terms of its efforts to sign a free trade agreement with, with ASEAN and with Indonesia and in other efforts like this, do you really see a significant overall shift in terms of the level of Canada's, the share of Canada's exports that are going to be going to the United States? Or is, just, is the gravity rule of economics, has it already reached its, its limit at this point? Mark, you want to go first? Sorry, Mark, you want to go first? Okay, so... Um, let me say this. I, I don't think it's a question of harmonizing the TPP with RCEP. I, I think it's um, the scopes are somewhat different, uh, but I don't think that's problematic. Like if you think about Canada's situation, you know, we've had a free trade agreement with the U.S. in some form or another for, for many, many years now. <clears throat> and if we had a dispute with the U.S., we always had the option of, of taking that dispute to either to settle that within the within the within the, the 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 WTO framework or our our FTA framework and I think the same thing um, is is uh, is happening with these free uh, regional agreements is that you know if you're a party to both you're, you're gonna have some options and so I don't think um, any kind of inconsistencies in these agreements are are killer like we, we notice that many countries <laughs> sign up all kinds of agreements and I think, um, as we see, like the infrastructure with the WTO has pretty well been destroyed. So it's great that there are other agreements available. So I would say, you know, sign as many agreements as you can. Thank you. So very quickly to your question, I don't know. Um, Cedric's Purbus, yeah. You know, Canada's less a middle power than it is a muddle power. Our, our secret strength is that the country just kind of muddles through. And same thing with trade policy, seizing business opportunities. We've got an incredibly good deal with the U.S., fattest, richest, easiest market on the planet. Why are you going to fight twice as hard to go to Honduras just because the government signed a trade agreement that, that opens up that market? The events, events will determine what happens. If the U.S. imposes more non-tariff barriers, if the U.S. continues to raise the risk, the cost of business decisions. If new economic opportunities arise from new products, as we transition, especially in the West, to develop new products, moving from commodities to new process goods, the markets change. And you've seen this with canola. It's increasing trade with the US, but I can imagine other developments, technological developments, changes in the nature of what we export because we're changing the nature of what we produce that could take us into other markets. And finally, time. You know, it takes a while for it to sink into the business community, the SMEs and the agricultural producers with whom we spend a lot of time. It takes time for the agreement to be known. It takes time for people to get comfortable. Despite the great work our trade commissioners do on talking circuits, seminars, et cetera, the number of people that still aren't aware of the agreements we have is up here, <laughs> the number. And not the, the folks in Ottawa that have consultants and lobbyists, but the folks out in places like Lethbridge that are aware we have these agreements, I would argue, is, is really down here, and that takes time. Thanks. All right, um, I knew Dan was gonna have a question. That's why we left time for questions. Dan Churiak. Uh, thanks, Carlo. Um, I am Dan Churiak, and I'm a fellow with the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada and a few other uh, places here in Canada. Uh, so I would like first to make an observation, and this is on the French thing. Um, 
if we, we recall back in uh, at the negotiation of the NAFTA, um, uh, Gary Hoffbauer and, and Jeff Schott made a presentation to Congress, and they pointed out that the whole purpose of NAFTA was basically to pull supply chains out of Asia into Mexico. Um, and that was fence shoring, that was near shoring, it was to uh, deepen North American integration. And if, if we analyze the USMC, or CUSMA as we call it here in Canada, it's a decidedly negative agreement for Canada and for, for the United States as well, and for Mexico because of the protectionism built into it, especially for Mexico. And a number of, obs uh, of, of observers have pointed out that we are losing Mexico. So if we wanted to actually strengthen North American integration, drive nearshoring, the U.S. could sign on to TPP, and that would accomplish that. It would be positive for the U.S., a positive for North America. If we then expanded the membership of, of the uh, TPP to include Korea, to include Taiwan, for example, Thailand, et cetera, and then possibly even China, that would also then strengthen the resilience of supply chains within the region. So the question is, is anyone in Washington thinking about really reconsidering the TPP? And I would also point out that if we were to get China into the TPP, the TPP was always about writing the rules for, uh, for uh, commerce in, in Asia. This signs China onto those rules it would improve upon the free trade agreement that New Zealand and that Australia have with uh, China. It would improve upon the phase one agreement that the U.S. has with China. And it would level the playing field for Canada with the United States, with Australia, and with New Zealand in that market. So that's the question I have is for Washington. Are you thinking about how you could, with one stroke of the pen, and then a bit of expansion of TPP, really solve most of your trade problems in the Pacific Rim? I also have a question for um, Mark. The financial market reaction to the CPP uh, Congress was massively, massively negative. So you put up a lot of statistics which uh, show that, of course, uh, investment was still flowing to China. Does it matter anymore trying to get China into uh, uh, an agreement like the CPT, uh, CPTPP if, in fact, uh, private capital is, is going to abandon China. I'd like your, your view on, on, on that market reaction. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we'll turn to Rachel for a 30-second response. But first, uh, the new NAFTA agreement, defense of Canadian sovereignty from encroachment by the Americans starts with the name of the agreement, new NAFTA. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the short answer to your question is not anyone with enough seniority. Um, I think they should be. I think it's something people like myself, you know, think very strong, you know, um, but I think um, the U USTR has made it particularly clear that they don't see, and, and of course, you know, Sharon highlighted that the Trump administration pulled out, but it was highly likely that if there had been a Clinton administration, there would have been changes, and of course there were changes ultimately demanded in CPTPP, it added some of the, the words. So um, I, I think Catherine Tai, um, I, I think is, and it's, I'm not saying it's just about her um, in that sort of role, but I think um, while it would be a good solution, the other thing super briefly to sort of Zach's question, that is, is to say it's not only about volumes and shares, but some of the solutions that Carlo and others on the panel have talked about have been actually about um, Canada adding value to its resource exports. And that's harder for us to measure, right, from, you know, as, as trade economists and the like, just as it's harder for us to measure services. But I think that is a metric that policymakers are that need to watch um, because the dynamics that would lead to, you know, sort of making sure to I mean, sometimes it's, it's just because of adverse policies, one has to find ways around it. But in an ideal world, looking for ways, I think that's, that's an important metric, and that's why some of these standards and non-tariff barriers are so important. Sorry, not a 30-second answer. <laughs> All right, Mark, your, your turn for a 30-second attempt. Yeah, 30 seconds. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for your question, Dan, and it's nice to see you. Um, I, I would say, um, first of all, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't run economic policy based on uh, movements in the stock market. Uh, you know, stock market's highly volatile and it changes from day to day. 
And so I would not I would not keep that as the as the metric by which I would you know calibrate my my policy. I think the negative reaction uh, uh, in in Chinese financial markets was probably due to the unexpected um, absence of Li Keqiang from the uh, standing committee, the Premier Li Keqiang, and also perhaps Wang Yang. These are two guys who have been uh, very pro business uh, through their through their careers. They, they've They've helped uh, uh, shepherd through a lot of tax cuts for business, and it's one of they are probably uh, at least a couple of the reasons that that uh, you know private business is actually booming in China. You don't hear about that a lot, but uh, the statistics show that it's uh, unprecedented times to to be uh, a private entrepreneur in, in China. I feel uh, you know uh, not looking at the stock market data, but just looking at the FDI data so far this year. You know, given all the, the tensions and COVID and zero COVID and all these things, one might have expected uh, foreign businesses to pull out, but we just don't see that in the data. So I guess I don't, I don't agree with the assumption that foreign capital is leaving China. I think that, uh, you know, uh, it might take businesses a while to um, uh, settle down to the new uh, political configuration. And, and, and uh, I expect that, uh, we'll see strong levels of investment in China um, over the near term and the medium term. Thank you, Mark. And now over to uh, Paul Evans for our last question. Um, I'm, thank you, and uh, Paul Evans from University of British Columbia. I'm not sure this is a question as much as a comment based on what has been an exceptional panel uh, and discussions of matters that do link back into the issues have been on the on the table for the last um, uh, the last day and a bit, but I'd, I'd like to frame it just a little bit provocatively. Um, and Professor Tan's presentation was so clever and brilliant in illuminating three different worlds of economic interactions. Uh, a, a wonderful framing, and I, I'd like to fr frame the comment this way: Carlo Dade said. It's economics, it's events, it's producers that are going to decide where uh, uh, things are going to move in, uh, in, in this next period. And with all deference to my good friend Carlo, I think he's only half right uh, in that we are in an era of securitization with capital S. Now, uh, this doesn't mean that all elements of the world economy are going to shift. Uh, but it sure means that there's an impetus here now that is extraordinarily powerful. And that what does trump that can be national security and can be conflict. The United States relationship with China now is primarily defined as adversarial. There's, com uh, there's cooperation elements. But in light of that and, and, a, and a decrease in, uh, or increase, let me put it positively, an increase in the national securitization in multiple countries. And Canada is on the edge of this now with the Freeland uh, approach. This is ultimately about securitization. In that context, please give us some insight into whether the semiconductors business that we've been talking about is the wave of the future. Because if it is, that is adversarialism with a capital S securitization. Uh, and so for us in Canada, uh, who are a little bit more ambivalent about framing China as an adversary as compared to the other parts of the three Cs, we're really at a moment of significant reflection on where things are going. And we need all of your thumbs up or thumbs down. Is my securitization thesis overstated? And is this actually the beginning of the new international political economy? Thanks. All right, I'll pass it around. Thanks. You know, half right is actually pretty good, um, for g given my track record and some other things. So, so I'll, 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 I'll take that any day of the week. Um, why don't we start with, who wants to start from the panel? Anyone want to jump in before I pick somebody? I can jump in. Okay. There we go. Thank you. So, um, thanks for thanks for that comment. I completely agree on the securitization. Um, so I would say that right now the United States and, and China are in a very dangerous securitization spiral where each is feeding off of the actions 
of the other and responding by escalating the securitization of their economic policy. So in the past month, we saw this being um, entrenched at the highest levels in, in China during their 20th Party Congress, where the term security was mentioned. Um, the counts vary, but uh, one, one count I heard was over 90 times in Xi Jinping's uh, report to the 20th Party Congress. The report also officially upgraded and altered China's threat assessment uh, by noting that China's um, uh, in a period where strategic opportunity coexists with different uh, risks and so on. This is a trend that uh, is not new. It's been emerging in, in China for some time now. In the twenty in, in the five-year plan that was released last year. Uh, Xi Jinping's speech mentioned the, the term security something like 17 times. We see the proliferation of security framing across a number of different uh, governance issues in China. So economic security now was mentioned in, in the 20th Party Congress speech, but alongside that also phrases such as ideological security, system security, and so this is in direct reaction to some of the coercive actions that have been coming from the United States. And of course, the United States has been responding to uh, events in, in China as well. And I think part of the problem is that many of the coercive actions being uh, enacted by the United States have come without an overarching articulation of what the United States envisions for its economic re relationship with China beyond describing the relationship as one of competition. It's not a very illuminating statement, and it allows um, and pushes the government within China to interpret the coercive actions as part of a broader strategy of containment. And so I think there's a need now to think about steps for de-escalating this security spiral between the two countries. And I think it's important for other countries, such as Canada, but also countries within ASEAN and so on, to articulate what their desired economic relationship with uh, China is and to distinguish it from the securitization spiral. Um, to that effect, I don't think French shoring moves us away from de-escalation. Thank you, Yeling. Anyone, we're actually 15 minutes over. Anyone have another attempt at 30 seconds or? Uh, I'll be really 30 seconds. Um, yes, I agree, and Yeling put it very well. So did you, Paul. Um, and, and, and I think de-escalation could be key. Um, the lack of kind of coordination and channels to have some of these conversations, I think, is, 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 is impaired. And, and in, in our whole conversation today, we haven't even talked about the fact that there are lots of folks in D.C. that are sort of planning to sort of take the coercive um, coalition on Russia and think about what that might look like on, on China. Um, and, you know, lots of think tanks are, are doing those reports. Um, so I, I think the sort of spaces for de sort of de-escalation and, and off-ramps and really thinking about these issues, um, we will see some clarifications. We saw them from Commerce today on the semiconductors, but at the same time they're talking about quantum computing, they're talking about other sectors. So I think this direction of travel is, is, is more. Thanks. Totally and, not 30 seconds. Sorry, guys. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at a 30-second response to Paul. Uh, no, see if I can do sorry, better than half yes. right here. <laughs> there aren't any, I don't know that there are many members or if any members of the private sector in the room. But again, my point is, it, oh, okay, we've got one guy from the private sector in yeah. the background. Thank goodness. <laughs> So the, the, the point about tens of millions of transactions every day, your question starts from the basis of the nation state as a principal actor. For a lot of what we've been discussing, that is true. For the private sector, you have multinationals that aren't beholden to one country, whose interests are the corporate interest. You also have tens of millions of businesses. There are just so many actors. It's like water flowing. Look at the sanctions in Iran. Look at the sanctions with Cuba. Businesses find ways to get around to gain security considerations. 
It's an obstacle. They get over non-tariff barriers and they'll find ways around. I think you're giving too much predominance and too much weight and not enough to the creativity, for good and bad, of the private sector. It's like water flowing over a rock. It will find a way. You can slow it down. You can try to divert it. But I think it's too much. And I think we're just going to disagree on that point, And that's going to be one of the first disagreements we've had in ages. <laughs> So, uh, again, thank you for sticking around for so long. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Oh, I should note that uh, Canada West is going to model China's ascension to the TPP. Um, so with Dan, we're looking forward to that coming out in the new year. So stay tuned. Uh, we hope to have some interesting numbers. And we want to take those numbers down to Mexico and engage in a North American, uh, or North North America, South South America, discussion about how we interact uh, in the, uh, around the Pacific Rim. So stay tuned for that. But join me in thanking from Eugene, Oregon, Yeling Tan. From Montreal by way of Shanghai, or Shanghai by way of Montreal, Mark Kruger. To my left, Rachel Simba and my colleague at the Canada West Foundation and Asia Pacific fellow and Dan Churiak disciple, uh, <laughs> Sharon Sun. And many thanks to Carlo for, for, yeah. this, for, for you, guiding Carlo. us through it all. Thank you. <laughs>